Okay, our next video will focus on the end of the Julio-Claudian line, so a group of emperors that were all joined together by a similar ancestry, similar family line. Um, this family included Augustus, uh, but then began to include a number of what we now consider to be bad emperors. Um, these emperors that tended to be more ineffective, that were um, not well received either by the Senate or by the public. Uh, those emperors include people like Nero, who we see here, who was the last of the Julio-Claudian emperors, and also people like Caligula, who um, we won't have too much time to talk about, but uh, very famous stories or infamous stories exist about him as well. Uh, what we'll be focusing on in terms of the architecture here is a building called the Domus Aurea, um, or Golden House. So this was the new palace that Nero constructed for himself uh, following a great fire in the year 64 AD or CE. So, as you can imagine, uh, Rome is a very tightly packed city. You can see that here in this reconstruction image or this illustration. Um, very, very dense city, a city that uh, was very, very tightly packed. Uh, similar to maybe cities like New York today where rents are high and you don't have a lot of space. Um, however, Nero took a large amount of land that had become available following the fire and built for himself what essentially was a very, very large country villa in the center of the city. So we can see how it includes things like artificial lakes and large courtyards. Um, so basically taking up quite a bit of space in the center of the city. Uh, today, we you can go and see the remnants of this structure. Uh, there is some excavation that happens there and so we'll see some of the interior shots but most of the luxurious materials that decorated this golden house or Domus Aria have been removed. The sculptures as well, the decorations um, no longer really exist because there's been so much uh, looting and archaeology you know, discoveries and removal from this area. Also, because Nero was not a emperor that was appreciated uh, following his rule, he was forced to commit suicide. Uh, he, because of that, the palace was very much kind of covered over. Eventually, the Colosseum will go in the area where one of the lakes or one of the water features are. The large lake will be replaced by the Colosseum. So, anyways, the memory of the palace is kind of a stain on the city. Uh, let's focus in on the octagonal room, which is part of one of the wings of the Domus Aurea. So the octagonal room exists like this today, um, said to be designed by Severus and Keller. And so we see here a structure that's quite important for later architectural development. So it's important just to keep in mind some of the vaulting techniques that we see here and some of the lighting effects that we see, because when we get onto structures like the Pantheon, we will be repeating and discussing some of the um, techniques and terms that we use here. So you can see there's a large opening right at the center here, an oculus-like form uh, that we will also see in the Pantheon in just a little bit. But there was also a system of what we call groin and barrel vaulting in these outer corridors. So I'll show you that in just a second. Um, this was probably a dining room. It probably had um, some water features close by. They probably took advantage of some of the vaulting systems for lighting effects. Um, you have to imagine that the room would have been richly adorned, not only with paintings or frescoes, but also with valuable materials, all of which unfortunately do not survive. Um, but by having people or individuals in this structure, you can get a sense of its scale, a sense of its grandeur, um, and a sense of the large quality of this building project, because this is just one small room within a very, very substantial palace. So just getting an idea of what these vaulting structures are, just so we have them in mind. Um, this is a reconstruction of how it may have been decorated, um, so that's one proposal. Um, but on the outer area, you can see there are areas for groin vaults and barrel vaults. And so a barrel vault is just a perfectly semicircular arch that is then repeated over and over again to create basically what's half of a barrel form. If you cut a barrel in half, you kind of would get the sense of what a barrel vault would look like. Um, so basically a curved space that's covering a room. And then if you take two barrel vaults and intersect them, you get what's called a groin vault. So this is the groin area or the join um, between the two vaults. And so uh, both barrel vaulting and groin vaulting are very, very important in Roman construction, but also very important in later religious construction. So we'll see them in churches and in mosques, and we'll um, begin to see more creative uses of these architectural forms. 
And also I just wanted to point out, so you have the opening here with the oculus, but then you also had light that would stream in on the outer portion here. Um, so as I said, there were numerous lighting effects that were taken into consideration when designing this structure. And the Romans seem to have become very interested in creating these types of impressive structures. All right, there's just another view to give you more of a three-dimensional quality of how those vaulted systems would extend out from the octagonal room. Uh, so as I mentioned, the palace was very, very large. The Domus Aurea was a very, very large, essentially country villa in the middle of the city. It was not well received. Nero um, was not a favorite by the end of his rule. Uh, so he became known as one of the bad emperors. Uh, a new emperor comes into power named Vespasian, and his family is the Flavian, this the Flavian dynasty. And so the Flavians create an amphitheater. They drain the artificial lake where the Domus Aurea, where the Domus Aurea had this artificial like they drain it and they take this private location and make it a place for the public. They make it a place where people can go and see games. And games and entertainment were a very important part of life in ancient Rome. If you were going to pay to live in the capital, if you were going to pay that premium of living in the center of the of uh, the empire, you were going to want impressive entertainment. So the city had theaters and sometimes temporary amphitheaters set up, but when the Colosseum was created, the city now had an extremely tall, very large, the largest amphitheater, um, very impressive structure where people could come and see games, and games would last all day. Um, the calendar of games and holidays um, was very extensive in ancient Rome. It seemed to grow by the year. So uh, this became a really important structure just for going to enjoy the city and enjoy the recreation that was available there. So it fit somewhere around 60,000 people or so. Um, it would have been relatively comfortable, had things like drinking fountains and limited restrooms. Um, they had sails that they are basically like coverings that they would use um, on particularly hot days. And Rome, of course, in the summer is a very, very warm city. So this was a way of keeping things relatively cool. Uh, and there were uh, expensive seats. There were certain areas that were more luxurious. Um, people would have an idea of where they're supposed to sit through um, a ticket which would tell them where they would enter and what level they could sit in. So it was all very regimented in a similar way to how our um, sports arenas are. So you know telling you exactly where you're supposed to sit and certain seats are more expensive than others and more desirable than others. Um, the way the Colosseum looks today, most of the marble seatings have been removed, um, so sometimes they'll put in temporary seating. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the building material was removed later on in later constructions around Rome, so a lot of the older structures became um, basically sites to take stone and to take valuable material um, when they were needed for other building projects. Uh, also, Rome was sacked a number of times, so those are also occasions when valuable materials would be taken. But you can see that the inside's pretty rough. You can get a sense of the, um, basically the chambers down below where people could wait, where people think things could be stored. Um, there would be a floor, of course, over it, so I'm showing you a reconstruction from the movie Gladiator. Um, but anyways, you would have this floor, you would have seats, and when they do have concerts in the Colosseum today, they will put up a temporary floor and temporary seating. All right. Um, another really interesting type of sculpture that we see in the Flavian period is, of course, the continuation of portraiture. We know portraiture is an important part of ancient Roman culture, um, and we can really easily date female portraits typically because of the hairstyle. So the Flavian hairstyle was very distinct. We have this very distinct, very large hairstyle, um, almost beehive style. And we also tend to see these really striking um, female portraits where the face tends to look a little bit older, more matronly, with a very perfect, youthful Venus-type body, or Aphrodite in the Greek form type body. So here we see um, this Venus pudica gesture kind of covering up her breasts and genitalia in a modest gesture. Um, however, having this more matronly feature, so kind of combining uh, an esteemed woman, a mother who has you know, been through childbirth, who has experience, combined with this ideal body of the of this ideal mother figure in ancient Rome. Venus was very, very important in the city of ancient Rome. So um, it seems to be an unusual type of funerary sculpture. That's what they were probably created for, to commemorate people's mothers. So it seems unusual to us today, um, but I think it provides a lot of insight into the culture as we reflect back on it. Okay. 
Um, our next structure is the form of Trajan, which was known as one of the most beautiful structures in all of Rome when it was created. It was built with money from the Dacian campaigns, so a lot of the structures in Rome were built with money from different military campaigns. So um, this was built with money from the Dacian campaigns, the Colosseum was built with money from campaigns in Jerusalem, uh, so you can see that these campaigns were necessary for building large projects in the city. Um, so let me just go through the structure. Unfortunately, very little of it survives. So you have this large open space here. You have exedra on either side. Um, you have a basilica structure here known as the Basilica Opia. Two libraries, one for Latin, one for Greek. And then you have a column which commemorates those Dacian campaigns. And finally, a temple dedicated to the divine Trajan. And so you can see that towards the back. Uh, so this structure is very interesting because the basilica gives us a sense of what later churches are going to look like, so keep this structure in mind. Um, a basilica in ancient Rome was typically for judicial affairs, um, but will be repurposed in the Christian period with an aisle here, you know, seats and an altar to create a longitudinal plan for a church. So this is the basil Basilica Opia, the name of uh, the, the family name of Trajan, who's known as one of the best emperors and who takes the emperor, empire of Rome to its largest extent. And then this is his Colosseum, where you can see those stories of the Dacian campaigns wrap around the column, very difficult to see, but we imagine that when the libraries were on either side, you could stand up on the balconies and maybe get a better sense of what was going on uh, on the column. <clears throat> Next we have Hadrian, and Hadrian was a Grecophile. He loved Greece. He started wearing a beard, which was relatively unusual, um, which is something we see, for example, with Pericles, who was a leader in ancient Greece. So that's something interesting about Hadrian. Also, he had a relationship with a young man named Antinous. So he was married, but he also had um, this homosocial relationship with Antinous. And Antinous became a favorite of Hadrian, but he died at a very, very young age, at 19. Uh, and they were actually going down the Nile in Egypt. So this became a really um, kind of suspicious story. Different conspiracies developed. Um, but Hadrian actually had a temple dedicated to Antinous. Um, declared him a god like he did with his wife as well. Um, he had a large number of artworks commissioned to commemorate Antinous, this beautiful young man, um, and here we see him in Egyptian dress, kind of connected to this idea that he died in the Nile, uh, or that he died in Egypt. Um, so here we see Antinous. So the fact that Hadrian had this relationship was not unusual, but the fact that he was so sad when, he, when Antinous died uh, is quite striking, that he uh, took so much time to commemorate him. Uh, next, I just wanted to point out his wife. This is Sabina, and so you can see she also was declared a goddess, and this becomes very popular around this time. So Trajan's declared a god, Augustus is declared a god, um, Sabina, the wife, is declared a god goddess. So um, this becomes quite common around this time. So you can see she's being carried aloft on this winged creature. Um, this is her funeral pyre. Down below is a personification of the Campus Martius, where often these pyres would take place. And then you can see Hadrian here um, pointing up towards the sky and we know of course it's Hadrian we can see his beard there and here I'm just showing another bust portrait so just to reinforce the fact that a lot of deifications or the process of apotheosis this was happening a lot um, among the royal among the imperial family among the empire the emperor and his family um, and our final structure for the High Emperor Empire is to look at the Pantheon. The Pantheon is a structure that was to commemorate all the gods. It's very unusual because most structures dedicated to gods that were considered pagan by the Christian period were destroyed. Um, however, this structure was considered pretty special, and so uh, it was dedicated to the Virgin, and now it functions as a church, but also as a tourist site to see this structure. So we know that Hadrian really liked domed forms, so we see there's a large dome on top of it. Um, it also says Marcus Agrippa, consul for the third time, built this, um, but that's actually, Marcus Agrippa was a figure that was an associate of Augustus, and we know that there was an earlier pantheon that he helped to build, um, another one burned down, I think, under Domitian. Um, but eventually this one, probably designed by um, Hadrian or by Apollodorus of Damascus um, or a different architectural associate, um, they were the ones or this was designed under Hadrian. It was one of Hadrian's favorite structures. Hadrian generally did not like being in Rome, um, but he was very proud of the structure. There would have been a large courtyard in front of it. Um, there would have been bronze decoration. Unfortunately, that does not survive today. 
As we look at the dome, we get a sense of how large it is, how it tends to be thinner at the top and then very thick here. You have um, walls that are something like 12 to 20 feet thick in different areas, um, depending on because there's so much weight coming down from this poured concrete dome. Uh, so very, very striking just in its overall design. You have a perfect sphere that can fit in the